Our Father, we plead for your presence. We need Jesus like we've never needed you before. And I plead that you would take control of this tent for your glory. That it may be your house. We thank you for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath. You know, I believe that God wants to do something special today. Amen. I was driving on the road and I saw a sign that said, your family needs you and you need grace. And it wasn't talking about the grace of God. It was talking about the market, you know. Grace can let you down on this earth. But the grace of God will never let us down. What do you say? Amen. Praise God. I thank God for bringing us here safely and for your pastor who shared his pulpit today, which is God's pulpit, but shared it with us that we can praise God together. Amen. Amen. Uh, when we flew in from the States, we flew over Jamaica, we saw the beauty that was there. You know Jamaica is a beautiful place. You know that, don't you? Amen. Uh, when you see the blue waters and the green water and the, the blue sky, the trees, and you know I love mango. <laughs> and they tell me that there was still a little bit left as if God left it for me. Praise God. But it's a beautiful place. And I think that sometimes because of that beauty that we might forget that a crisis is coming. And you know that I didn't come from the States to tell you of the beauty of Jamaica. You can see that for yourself. I came here to tell you that a storm is coming. Why you look and think that the storm is coming just in Bermuda and you think that you've been tucked away. You know, in the Caribbean, Jamaica is tucked in a very nice place, strategically. Right here in Jamaica, that's good. Right here in Jamaica, strategically, you can see that it's tucked away so that the average storm doesn't hit it. But I'm going to tell you, this storm I'm talking about, you can't be tucked away from. And the reason why we are here today, you know, we're doing a series of meetings down at the hall and other places, Elder Mason and myself, We've been invited to come to your island, praise God, to share with him. All this week, every night, between 5 and 9, we're going to be studying the word of God. 6 and 9, we're going to be studying the word of God. I pray that every one of you makes it out. Amen? Uh, but this morning, we're going to be studying something very important. I believe that the time has come to finish the work. You believe that? I believe we're living in the most significant time of all this earth's history. Now, the prophet of God says... If you notice this, and they tell me, still on this island, they tell me that you still believe in the prophet. Is that right? Yes. Amen. I'm going to ask, maybe the platform can come down because there's a few seats just so everybody can see the screen. So if all the persons, are, our young people have done such a wonderful job, if you can come down and sit on these front rows, praise God, or find where your par parents are, your guardians are, praise God. Now you brought your Bibles. Everybody brought their Bibles? Let me thank you. brought your Bible. Let me see that Bible. Make sure you brought it. Praise God. I know you didn't come to church without a Bible. Amen. Why, you can never get back to Jesus without a Bible. Why, it would be foolish to come to a battleground without a weapon. Why, what would a military man look like to have no weapon and he comes on the battlefield? We need Bibles, amen? Now, some people would tell me that the Bibles look different in Jamaica. You know, I go to different places and they say the Bibles look different. Sometimes they think that a cell phone is a Bible. You don't think that in Jamaica, though, praise God. I remember I was on another island... And it wasn't here, so praise God, it wasn't here. It was a place far from here. And while I was on that island, the man that brought us in, he was announcing the meetings, and he had one of those electronic Bibles. Now, there's nothing evil about an electronic Bible, amen? It's a gadget. Nothing evil about that. If you're in the woods somewhere and you don't have anything else, I pray, read it, amen? But it's not a real Bible. And so I was praying, I said, Lord, do something to that Bible. Now, not to the man, of course. And about the third night of the meeting, the man stood up, announced the meeting, and said the text of the meeting will be such and such. And he, he got ready to announce the text. And as he got ready to announce the text, then he stood up and he said, my Bible has gone out. I said, praise God. Amen. Then he said, could somebody get me a real Bible? I said, yes, get that man a real Bible. Can you imagine what Martin Luther would have looked like trying to start the Reformation? 
coming up to the Pope with an iPad. Coming up to the Pope, the Pope would have threw him, threw him in the fire himself. Coming to the Pope with a little iPad mini, 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 what? How are you going to start a reformation with a cell phone? But there was a Bible. Martin Luther said, here I stand, I can stand, take no other, may God help me. I'm going to tell you something, it's dangerous to tell you what I'm going to tell you this day, today. Why, they, they were afraid to let us come and tell you this, but I got to tell you the truth. Yes. Why, I would rather come on the island and eat mangoes and say nothing than to stand behind a pulpit and to lie to you. Yes. You need to understand something, brothers and sisters. Jesus is getting ready to come. Yes. And God needs his church to stand up and be counted. How in the world can you have an island? There is no other island so much where the percentage of Christians on the island are Seventh-day Adventists. Why you have today in this island over 2.8 million uh, Jamaicans. You have on this island uh, over 64% Protestant. Not Catholic, Protestant. And of the Protestants, the majority Seventh-day Adventists. Why you can't fly into the island and not meet a Seventh-day Adventist. Why we got into the island, the man talked to me, and he, he looked a little crooked for a moment. Then I looked back at him. We said, we're seven Adventists. Then he straightened up. He said, I am too. <laughs> Every 15 people that you pass by, one is a seven Adventist. And God wants to use this church, the seven-day Adventist church, to cause Jamaica to be set on fire. You see, the devil's afraid of Jamaica. Listen to me. You see, the Jamaica is composed of the type of element that can explode this world. You see, it's not easy. It's not easy to control a Jamaican. No, it isn't. Tell me the truth. It's not easy. You can look at the streets and tell you it's not easy to control a Jamaican. Why, if they tell you two lanes, you make four. You know I'm telling you the truth. It's not easy to control a Jamaican. And the devil's afraid of this. You don't believe me, you ask colonization. Of all the different tribes that were enslaved, Jamaica threw off the shackles most quicker than any other group except for Haiti. And this type of mentality, it can be a small group. But you know, if you take some dynamite, the dynamite can't be set off unless you have a fuse on the dynamite. But the fuse is the smallest part. The fuse is a small thing, but it's made of the nature that can cause an explosion. Jamaicans are a fuse. And if they have been given the message of seven-day Adventism, the island is going to explode. The world is going to explode. There is enough people in this tent today that can turn this world upside down. No, 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 right side up. The devil turn it upside down. There's enough in this room right now. Why, 12 men turn the world the right side up. 12 men. Where there are several times more than 12 here, Jamaica should be set on fire. From the hills of Mandeville. From Kingston and Spanish Town. From Port, uh, 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 Port, what's that Port? You know the Port. <laughs> Everywhere in this place, in fact, they tell me, listen, 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 crisis is coming. Look what the prophet says. They tell me you believe in the prophet, is that right? Yes. Prophet, first manuscript, page 33. Let's read it together. Father, bless these words in Jesus' name, amen. It says, it is what? Too late in the day to feed with milk. They tell me all you want is milk. I don't believe that. Why, listen, if you were a baby, milk is all right. Now think about it. An infant, he drinks breast milk. Is that right? What's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong with that. That's natural. That's the best food for that infant. That's the best food for that infant. But I want to ask you a question. If you were to see a man right here in Mandeville come into this tent, a man, 80 years old, still on breast milk, what would you say? Why you say that's sick? It's all right for the child. It's not all right for the adult. Are you with me? And it's a shame that we turn our churches into milking stations. But I don't know about you, but I don't got milk. I got Jesus. 
I know what the prophet says. It is too late in the day to feed with milk if souls are a what? Month or too old in the truth. She says that they're just two months in the truth. One month in the truth. It says who are about to enter the what? Time of trouble such as never was. Let me tell you something in Jamaica. A storm is coming. The pulpits are not telling you that. The press is not telling you that. The gleaner doesn't even know about it. It says, cannot, if they cannot hear what? All, not just true, but all the what? Do you want it straight, yes or no? Yes. Yes. They can't hear all the straight truth or endure the strong meat of the straightness of the way. How will they stand in the day of battle? You see, God must prepare people to stand. It says, truths that we have been years learning must be learned in a what? Brothers and sisters, we're going to prove this week. Now listen, we're going to talk about it today, but this week, every night this week, we're going to show you from the Bible, from history, from world events. We're going to show you that God has called this church and that we're living in the last few months of this earth's history and we are not ready. It says that what they have been years learning, we will have to learn in a what? few months by those who now embrace the third angel's message. Do you understand? God has people in every denomination. The majority of true Christians are not right now in the Seventh Adventist Church right now. They're in the Catholic Church. They're in the Baptist Church. They're in the Pentecostal Church. They're in the Monrovian Church. Why some of them not even going to church because of the hypocrisy. And they're still God's people. But God, brothers and sisters, must have a body because they don't know what's coming. And the body that God has prepared are called Seventh Day Adventists. And the devil knows this. Do you understand? It's no normal thing to be a Seventh Adventist. Why the greatest wealth of truth ever been given to mortals has been given to Seventh Adventists. We are called ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Why a Seventh Day Adventist should walk with his head up. A Seventh Day Adventist should walk with his clothes on his body. A seven Adventist should walk looking like a seven Adventist, talking like a seven Adventist. Why, when they met you in the streets, they shouldn't wonder if you're a Jamaican. They shouldn't ask you if you're from Kingston or Mandeville. They should say, you must be a Seventh-day Adventist. Why, when I got into the border, they weren't going to let us to get in. They said, you have to have an exact uh, location. And we didn't know the location. So they said, we must detain you. We said, God has blessed us. <laughs> the woman... She said, you know, I'm not a seven Adventist, but she said, I, I did know some seven Adventists. We'll let you through. You see, it's, it's a serious thing to be a seven Adventist. Now, brothers and sisters, do you know what the prophet says? Look now, this is the church. Watch. The prophet says, Acts of the Apostles, page 911. You love the prophet. Don't you love the prophet? Yeah. I love the prophet. Acts of the Apostles, page 9. It says, let's read it together. It says, many and what? Wonderful are the promises recorded in the scriptures regarding the what? Church, do you know that God from Genesis to Revelation has made promises about his church in the scriptures? It says through centuries of persecution, conflict and darkness, God has done what? Sustained his church. In other words, God is the one who's keeping his church afloat. It says God has sustained his church. Not one cloud has fallen upon it that he has not what? God is prepared for an emergency. It says, not one opposing force has written to counterwork his work. Let me tell you something. There are opposing forces on this island. There are opposing, opposing forces on them in America. There are opposing forces, principalities, and powers in high places. We don't fight flesh and blood. It says, not one opposing force has risen to counterwork his work that he has not foreseen. All has taken place. What? As he predicted, this should not make us upset at the church when someone says you can't have a meeting in the church. It shouldn't make you upset. Why, if somebody says that you can't preach the unadulterated truth, it shouldn't make you upset. It has been predicted. It has been prophesied. We are living out the dictates of the word of God. And this minister will not bow down to Baal. How long won't she between two opinions? If God be God, then serve him. Jesus is getting ready to come. It says, all this has been predicted. He has not left his church forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur, and that which his spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. This is a living prophecy under this tent. And I praise God for the open air. <laughs> I praise God for this tent. 
I praise God for anyone that wants to listen to the word of God. Amen. Someone says a word about the people that were fighting. That doesn't matter. We're not fighting flesh and blood. Amen. Jesus said, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Amen. Those that are going to finish the work must have the spirit of the lamb. Amen. Now, this says, all his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with his throne. And no power can destroy it. The truth is inspired and guided by God. And it will what? Triumph, Triumph over all opposition. You can't stop God. It says, he has sent forth his angels to minister to his church. And let's say that together. And the gates of hell have not been able to prevail against his people. Who said that? Jesus. The head of this church. Matthew 16, Jesus said that the gates of hell cannot be fail, prevail. What would I do look like saying that the church is going to be destroyed and go to another church if Jesus has said that the gates of hell cannot prevail? I would be a fool to say that. Look what this says. Testimonies to ministers. Now, we're just laying an introduction. You know that. I hope you don't want fast food. I hope you don't want fast food. They tell me in Jamaica, you like to eat ground food. You don't eat burgers and french fries and KFC. Right? They say in Jamaica, they want yam. Yeah. Isn't that what you tell me? They say in Jamaica, you want dashing. Is that what you tell me? You say in Jamaica, you got a ground somewhere where you can get the food from the ground. Yay, the yam so high, six feet tall. That's ground food. It takes more than a few days to make that. So you don't want no fast food, amen? Praise God. Now, this says... It says, although there are evils existing where? In the church. Are there evils in the church? Yes. Is there apostasy in the church? Yes. Is there problems in the church? Yes. Why, you can't find a church where there are not problems. As long as you and I are in it, you got some problems. It says, although there are evils existing in the church, the church in the last days is to be the light of the world, polluted and demoralized by sin. Let's read this together. It says, the church enfeebled and defective, needing to be not Pat it on the back, needing to be reproved, warned, and counsel still with all these problems is the only object upon on earth upon which Christ bestows his supreme regard. The prophet says the church is the apple of the eye of God. I love the church, don't you? Yes. Prophet says the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized, yes, God has an organized church. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry what? The gospel to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church, not outside of the church, but what? Through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. Let's read this together. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ. And through the church will eventually be made manifest even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. The final and full display of the love of God. Yes, I want to be a part of this church. Enfeebled and defective as it may appear. This is God's church. What do you say? But now, my brothers and sisters, having said that, if the church is going to finish the work, if you were the devil, what would you do? God will use this church to finish the work. This is why the Bible says, and the dragon was not happy with the woman. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make War. We are in a war, brothers and sisters. How can you wonder if somebody is not going to try to pick you off if you're in a war? Why, you don't have a church with such a crisis. Well, I'm not taking notes right now. You see, brothers and sisters, this is the work that's getting ready to be finished. And God has a church. What is God trying to do with this church? You know the condition? The devil, the devil is trying to put this church to sleep. And I got to tell you the truth. I can't lie to you. This is God's church. But the condition of the church, you see, the devil can't destroy it, but he can put it to sleep. I wonder if the Seventh Adventist Church on this island is sleeping. I wonder if the Seventh Adventist Church in America is sleeping. 
I wonder if the Seventh-day Adventist church is asleep. I wonder if the devil has given us a sleeping pill. And you know what we need to do? Now they tell me, you see, if you're in America, they will say, wake up. When you're in Jamaica, they say, wake up. Isn't that what they say? Wake up! Let's read this together. Look. Let's read this together. Look what the prophet says. Watch. Watch what the prophet says. I want you to see this. A revival of true godliness among us is the what? Greatest and most urgent of all of our needs to seek this should be our not second word, but our what? First word. There's no question. When I step foot on this island, I know that the greatest thing first is not first evangelism out there. I know it's revival and reformation in here. Why we make ourselves look foolish. When we go to the community in Jamaica and we look just as bad as they look. How in the world are we going to tell the world to put down his hand again and we still have one? How can we tell the world to put down ganja and we still growing it? How can we tell the world to do something different when our ministers and elders are sleeping with little boys and little girls? And you can't hide in Mandeville. Why well, you go to one person down there and they see you sneak around. And the community is looking. Listen. Now, I'm not telling you what I think. I'm telling you what I know. I'm telling you what I know. I know of a person right here in Mandeville that was getting ready to be baptized as a seven-day Adventist. But a minister approached her. And said, my wife doesn't have to know and your, your husband doesn't have to know. Let's just put down the, uh, uh, the world and let you and I fornicate. She said, but your husband, your, your wife. My husband, he said, they don't have to know right here in Mandeville. Don't act like this is not going on. This is going on in America. It's going on in Africa. It's going on in China. It's going on right here. The devil is the same no matter where you go. This is our greatest need. Now, what does a man look like? His family has divorced him. His children won't listen to him. Nobody loves him in his home. And then all of a sudden he comes to you and he says, you know what? I'm going to tell you how to have a happy home. Why you would laugh at that man? Would you listen to that man? <laughs> then if the Seventh Day Adventist Church is God's house, if we are messed up in here, how foolish does it look to go out there and tell them you're going to clean them up? Right. Revival and reformation must start within. Yes. Then when something happens in here, right. we can do something out there. Right. Do you understand? Prophet says that Satan's afraid of something. You know, he's afraid of this tent. He's afraid of this home. He's afraid of his message. Why? Let's read it. Let's see what the devil's afraid of. Select the message, book one, page 124. Let's read together. It says, there is nothing. How much is nothing? There is nothing. How much? Nothing. nothing. There is nothing that Satan fears so much as that the people of God shall clear the way by removing what? He's not afraid of the world, but he is afraid of God people if they do something. He's not afraid of you just because you call yourself a seven heavens. But he is afraid of us if we begin to work with Jesus in the most holy place. It says, removing every hindrance so that the Lord can pour out his spirit upon a, what's the next word? Languishing church. You know what language means? Language means that a man is sick. Man is dead. That a church is dying. It says this is a dying church if Satan, and an impenitent congregation, if Satan had it his way, there would, what's the next word? Never. Not sometimes, but what? Never. Never what? There would never be another awakening, great or... Do you think the devil wants there to even be a small awakening in Mandeville? This week, God is getting ready to unleash his power and his presence. And let me tell you something. You must make it up in your mind that you're not going to miss a single night. Because the devil's going to say, look, give them some work so they can't come. Let me tell you something. Do you know that when this crisis breaks, that we're going to stay? That people are going to run from Kingston to Mandeville to South Lamar. They're going to work, run everywhere. Saying, where's the tent? Where's the pastor? Where are the elders? Where's this church? But there's going to be a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread and water. Not a famine of yams and, 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 and dasim. But a famine of hearing the word of the living God. The Holy Spirit would have been withdrawn. 
And do you know that man's not going to say it's the far ways. Man will go from the east to the west. Man will drive for 10 hours straight to come hear the word of God. But it is going to be too late, brothers and sisters. Jesus is getting ready to come. And I don't care who doesn't like it or not. God in love is trying to save us. Why would we fight Jesus? If Satan had it his way, but the devil is not going to get it his way, praise God. There would never be another way, great or small, to the end of time. But we are not ignorant of what? His devices. And so the prophet says this to the sleeping church. She says, often we have been told that our cities are to hear the message, but how slow we are to heed the instruction. I saw, what's the next word? When it says capital O, it's not talking about a man on earth, it's talking about the man in heaven. It's talking about Jesus. It says, I saw one standing on a what? I can imagine the platform something like this. Standing on a high platform with arms extended. What was he doing? It says he turned and pointed in how many directions? I wonder if he pointed at Kingston. You think so? I wonder if he pointed at Montego Bay. Do you think so? I wonder if he pointed at Ocherez. Do you think so? I wonder if he pointed at Mandeville. Do you think so? It said he pointed in every direction. What did he say? He said a world perishing in ignorance of God's holy law and seven day Adventists are asleep. Sleep. The Lord is pleading for laborers for there is a what? Great work to be done. I'm going to say like the songwriter, wow on others thou art calling. Do not pass me by. I'm going to tell you something plain. Listen. There is no way to do what needs to be done in the world and in the church and compromise. This is not a place for cowards. This is not a place for men that can be bought or sold. The greatest want in the world today is the want of men that are true and honest in their inmost life. Men that are not afraid to call sin by his right name. Men that will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Men that are true to duty as the needle to the pole. Where are these men today? I think that we need to stop and pray. Because when I prayed last night, I was pleading with God. I couldn't go to sleep so easy. I'm pleading for this island. You see, Jamaica has a special place in my heart. In Jamaica, my. It has a special place. It's time. I don't know when Jamaica is going to ever get another time like we're telling you today. Time is running out. Yes. Not children today. They're, they're brainwashed by what's going over in the West. They're brainwashed by America. Men looking after Jay-Z. Beyonce. What can they do for you? 50 cent. I always say 50 cent don't even know who you are. Why, you will be singing 50 Cent, talking about him, what he's doing, and 50 Cent wouldn't even give you a dime. No, not just for the young people, preach it for us. I think we all need it. What do you say? It's not just the young person listening to Jay-Z. Why, it's amazing some old heads listening to Jay-Z. It's a worldwide problem, but I know that when a young person really hears the truth, young people love it. Young people wake up. See, young people don't like milk. You try to, you force them to have milk. They didn't want that. They wanted something else. It's time, brothers and sisters. Let's talk to Jesus. Would you reverently kneel? Those who can. I know you're on the ground, so you don't have to kneel if you, if you can. But I'm going to kneel. Amen. And let's approach the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father. We are in a crisis. The trumpet that should be given a certain sound has been muted. The mouth of the minister has been muzzled. And thy congregation is dying for the want of present truth. But we're so thankful, Lord, that even in the midst of these problems, that the answer is not leaving the church. The answer is not trying to establish our own church. You already have a church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. The answer is revival and reformation within this church through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we are helpless. Lord, I am a fickle, feeble, frail man. I need you, God. 
This congregation needs you, Lord. Remove any distractions. Cause the mouths that may be talking that would cause distraction to be silenced. Cause the atmosphere of the children to listen. The adults, all of us outside of the tent, in the back, wherever we are, to pick up a Bible and to listen, not to man, but to thus saith the words of Jesus. For Lord, it's not my brother nor my sister, Lord, it's me. It's me, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. Amen. If you can take your Bibles and turn to the book of Isaiah, to the book of Isaiah chapter 55, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. amen. Isaiah, the 55th chapter of the gospel of Isaiah, and we want to notice what the word of God says. I don't know how far we'll go, but we'll get as far as we can. Amen. Do you want fast food or do you want to study? Isaiah 55. Now, those who have eyes anointed by the Spirit of God. They see that one thing is certain. They see that the time in which we live is both solemn and significant. They see that we're not living in the ordinary times. We're not living at the beginning of time. We're living in the last days of this earth's history. My brothers and sisters, it's amazing that not only in the world, but even in the church, there are multitudes that believe that life is going on just as usual. The world has been here, they say, for 6,000 years. It could be here another 6,000 years. Why, that's a bunch of foolishness. They will tell us that nothing has changed, that we cannot really be living in the last days. But listen, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see that today we are in trouble. You don't have to have a degree in theology to see that we're in trouble. You don't have to have a degree in psychology or sociology to see the conditions of the world are as such that a crisis is developing in every nation of this world. You look in North Korea right now. You look in South Korea right now. You look in Iraq and Iran. You look at the militant uh, Muslim group called ISIS and this is a part of prophecy. Heads are being chopped off. Arms are being chopped off. The world is coming to an end and yet there are multitudes wondering, could we really be living in the last days? I just read the other day of a story of a doctor, a so-called physician, just got married on his wedding night. That's supposed to be the happiest day in a man's life next to accepting Jesus. Within an hour, he was fussing with his wife. Before that night was over, he had nearly beat his wife to death. A so-called physician. Before the night closed, the physician took out an assault weapon and on the day of his wedding, he blew his wife's brains out. This just happened a few days ago. Then turned the gun and shot himself. How can I wonder if we're living in the last days, the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from this earth. You look around, you know the headlines are saying, the headlines, I just read a headline that says grandmother has molested her grandson. The Bible says, can a mother forget her suckling child? And in the last days, the Bible says, yes, she can. The Bible says the love of many in the last days is going to wax cold. This is a sign that we're living in the last days. How can we wonder when we're living in a time when fathers are molesting and raping their little girls? Where mothers are turning their backs and strangling their daughters? How can we wonder when the very fiber and fabric of our society is unraveling? Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. This world is coming to an end. It's not just America. You say, oh, that's America. That's not Jamaica. Let me tell you something. It's just as bad here. When a man can take out a machete. And cut off the head of his wife and sit her on the doorstep. This is happening in Jamaica. This is happening in Spanish town. This is happening in Kingston. This is happening here. Where men can limb up somebody. And never once even bat an eyelash and watch him die in a pool of blood. This is the result of the Holy Spirit being withdrawn from man. Man cares nothing about another man. Man can be somewhere right here in these streets, cut off, get so upset, and all of a sudden pull out a gun and shoot you and think nothing about it. Go home and eat some ackee. Same thing. No different. My brothers and sisters, you better understand something. This is evidence that the Holy Spirit is being withdrawn from this earth. And do you know that this is one of the greatest signs that the world is getting ready to reach the limit? You say what I mean. I'll come back to Isaiah. Let's go to Genesis. Amen. Let's go to Genesis. We'll come back. Go to Genesis chapter 6. I want you to see this. We'll come right back to Isaiah. Genesis chapter 6. 
I want you to see that one of the greatest evidences that the world cannot continue much longer is the fact that God's spirit is being withdrawn from the earth. Notice Genesis beginning in verse 3. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Genesis chapter 6 beginning in verse 3. Let's read that together. The Bible says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man for that he is also flesh. Does the Bible say that God's spirit is just going to fight with man and can try to convict man for the rest of his life? Does it say that? The Bible says my spirit shall not always strive with man. In other words, there's going to come a time when the Holy Spirit says Ephraim is joined to his idols. Let him alone. There's going to be a time when God says this far and no further. Now, the Bible says that, 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 that what was the indication? It said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh, yet his days shall be what? A hundred and what? Now, do you notice that it was when the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the earth that God set a limit on how long the world could exist? The removal of the Holy Spirit has always been an indication that the world is getting ready to reach the limit. And it's amazing that the same things that call down the judgments of God on the antediluvian world, that nation before the flood, is going on in America right now. It's going on in Jamaica right now. Do you know what it was that made God say that my spirit shall not always strive with man? Do you know what happened? Something was taking place that was not right among the marriages. They were marrying. You look at the verse before. They were marrying in a way that God could not approve. Do you know what's going on right now? That there's a gay legislation of marriage right now. There's a type of marriages right now. Just like, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. But you know it. And someone says, well, the gay marriage will never come to Jamaica. I, I just came through Mantego Bay. I know it's coming. I saw it. And as long as there is a British influence, it's coming. It already happened in Europe. And as long as you're under this influence, you will not have the ability to resist. This country is getting ready to go down the ramp just like America. My brothers and sisters, when we see this, we should see that something is getting ready to set the limit. The Bible says that God's spirit is in all our strive with man. You see, there is a time frame involved in salvation. Notice what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. What book did I say? You're going to Isaiah. We're going back to the gospel of Isaiah. Isaiah 55. I want you to see from the Bible that the Bible does not say the plan of redemption is going to last forever. It doesn't say that the plan of salvation is going to be forever. There's a time frame involved with the plan of salvation. And this Sabbath morning, we are running out of time. 2014, we're running out of time. Isaiah 55. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Isaiah 55. And Isaiah 55 beginning in verse 6. And when you get there, let's read that together. You're there, amen? Yeah. Let's read verse 6 together. What does the Bible say? The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him when? Now, why is it? Now, notice what the Bible is doing. The Bible is suggesting a time where man is going to seek to get near to the Lord, but he will not be near. That God would have withdrawn himself, and though man has sought him early, he would not be able to find him. There is a time when the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord. Wow, that's a time. Wow, he may be what? So that suggests that there's going to come a time when God can not be found where we can run from east to the west, from one side of the island to the other, and still God would have withdrawn himself and probation would have closed. My brothers and sisters, this is getting ready to happen right now. The Bible says, seek him while he may be found. And my brothers and sisters, it's amazing that though this time from is here, that we still have a generation that are playing games with our salvation. We have a generation, you've got to force them to come to church. We have a generation who's got to force them to pick up a Bible. We have a generation today of youth and adults that, that they would rather be somewhere partying than studying the word of God. But my brothers and sisters, a change is getting ready to take place. We're getting ready to see a time when young people and adults that have been partying in the clubs, that have been partying in the dance hall, are going to get off the streets and recognize that a crisis is here. And they're going to run from east to west to find Jesus. But it's going to be too late. Can you imagine every seven Adventists wake up? Every seven Adventist young person puts down the CDs, puts down the video games, puts down the world and says, Lord, how can I be a child of God? Every adult now saying his work is not so important. But it's too late. And I am so glad that this morning it is not too late. 
I am so glad that this Sabbath morning we can still seek the Lord and I don't care how sinful we have been that there's opportunity to find salvation in Jesus Christ. This is why he went to the cross. This is why he suffered and bled and died. Jesus left a good place to come to a bad place. Jesus left a place that left him to come to a place that slapped him on the face and spit in his face and pulled out his beard and he said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. I tell you, all of heaven is interested in our salvation. Someone says, but it's too late for me. You don't know what I have in my closet. You don't know the sins that are in my life. You don't know the things that no one else knows in this tent. I don't know that, but I do know someone else. I know that there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners can plunge beneath that flood and lose all of their guilty stains. I know that we serve a merciful God. In fact, verse 7 says it. Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let's read it together. The Bible says, Let the what? Wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him do what? Return unto the Lord. It doesn't say God won't take him back. It says, And he will have what? Mercy upon uh, to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. We serve a merciful Savior. And if God were not so merciful, you know, we would have much smaller churches than we do today. So when we come to church and chew gum, you know, if that was back in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament, do you know, brothers and sisters, we would have been struck dead. We come here talking and slouching and sleeping. We would have been struck down just like us. Do you know we have a small church then? But I praise God that it's because of his mercy we're not consumed. His compassions fill not every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. But my brothers and sisters, this is not going to continue forever. Do you know that there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah? In fact, the Bible says in the book of Daniel, what book did I say? In the book of Daniel chapter 9, I want you to notice this because the devil knows that if we would wake up, are you going to the book of Daniel? Daniel chapter 9? If we would wake up and study the prophecies, do you know that the Bible tells us that God's people, if they wake up, the devil's afraid of that. If you start studying these prophecies with the desire to gain a friendship with Jesus, the devil's afraid of that. So the devil is tricky. Listen, the devil is tricky. The devil knows how to trick us. Watch him. Listen what he would do. The devil will make a man think that what he needs in the summertime is a heater. Now, you know in Jamaica, you don't need a heater. Amen. But the devil is tricky enough to make us think that what we need in the summertime is a heater and what we need in the wintertime is an air condition. That's foolishness. But that's how tricky the devil is. Watch it. You know what the devil does? You see, when a person comes like this, this week, what you're going to hear about the need of waking up and getting ready and trying to prepare for the coming of the Lord, the first thing the devil will do as that trickster will cry, fanatic, extremist, legalist, time setter. And you know what they love? Offshoot. Yes. Isn't that what they say? Isn't that what they say? They say he's an offshoot. They said Jesus was an offshoot. But Jesus had no synagogue. Jesus had a ministry to reach the synagogue. My brothers and sisters, we don't have no church. Why? I would disfellowship myself if I had a church. God has his church. Now, my brothers and my sisters, but I want you to understand something. History has always repeated itself. There is nothing new under the... Did the wise man say that? Where did he say that? In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. I want you to see what this says. Watch what this says. You believe the prophet. It says, now pride and envy did what? Close the door against the what? Now this is desire of ages talking about why the people of the church of that day rejected Jesus. Now let's read it. Desire of ages. You love that book, don't you? Yeah. Praise God. Let's read it together. It says, Pride and then they close the door against the light. If the reports brought by the shepherds, now the shepherds, they did not go to the rabbinical schools. They didn't have their degrees. They were common people. They were fishermen. It says, by the shepherds and the wise men were credited, they would place the priests and rabbis in a most what? Unenviable position. Disproving their claim to be the exponents of the truth of God. It said, these men listen to these shepherds that weren't ordained by these rabbinical schools and leaders. Then it says, that would make them appear that they don't know the Bible. Pride and envy. I didn't say it, the prophet said it. It says, these learned teachers 
would not stoop to be instructed by those whom they turn what? Heathen. Let's see what they said. Let's read it together. It says, it could not be. They didn't even think about it. They said, it could not be. It could not be what? What does it say? It could not be that God had passed them by to communicate with ignorant shepherds, common people, and uncircumcised Gentiles. They determined to show their contempt for the reports that were exciting King Herod and all Jerusalem. Let's see what they did. Let's read it together. It says, let's read it together. What does it say? It says, they would not even go to the tent. They would not even go to the hall. They would not even go to listen. It says they would not even go to Bethlehem to see whether these things were so. We've been told they're offshoot. Let's go and see if they're talking about offshootism. Let's go and see if they're using the Bible. Let's go and see if they say something different than the spirit of prophecy. How can you believe the report of someone and you have not even listened for yourself? The Bible says, study to show thy self approved unto God. A workman that he not be ashamed. It was because of this that they rejected the Messiah. And today, Jesus is being rejected. And the person of his saints' present truth is being discarded. Because men are too proud to humble themselves to the foot of Jesus. Bible says to the Lord and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. And if I say something that the Bible and the spirit of prophecy has never said, let my tongue cleave to the roof of his mouth. Let it fall on the ground. If I were to do something to destroy the church of God, enfeebled and defective as it may appear, this is God's church needing to be reproved and warned so there can be a revival and a reformation. Jesus is getting ready to come. And it said they would not even go. They led the people to regard the interest in what? Jesus as a fanatical excitement. So back there, if you were in the time of Christ, they would have told you, don't go to Bethlehem. If you were in the time of Christ, they would have told you, you can't believe that man. He didn't go to our schools. They would have told you he was a common man, an uneducated fisherman. You can't believe his interpretation of the scriptures. But my brothers and sisters, my question is, would you have accepted Jesus back there? Because the people that accepted Jesus back there, they had to be willing to be attacked and maligned and say, Jesus, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We can't attack back. We don't fight flesh and blood. It's not the men in the conference that we need to be upset about. It's the devil we need to be upset about. It's not the churches in Mandeville that we need to be upset about. It's the devil we need to be upset about. We need to press together so that a revival and reformation can turn this island right side up, reach the world, so that a body can be prepared for the coming of Jesus. Amen. My brothers and sisters, it says, began the rejection of Christ by the priests and rabbis. From this point, their pride and stubbornness grew. Do you know this pride brought to the place where Jesus could not even be born where he should have been born? He was born in a little stable somewhere. You know why? Because there was no room. For the great teacher. The same thing is happening today. My brothers and sisters, I want you to notice what the Bible says in the book of Daniel. You see, the devil is tricky. He calls fanatic. He calls extremists. You know what he loves to say? He loves to say, you don't need to study the prophecies. You don't need to study the, 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 the truth for the last days. Just focus on Jesus and his love. You ever heard that? Some of you may have said it. Some of us may have heard it said, don't focus on Jesus. That's what they say. Don't focus on the prophecies. But what I want to show you from your Bible, not my Bible, your Bible. I want to show you that the only reason why the prophecies came to us is because of the love of Jesus. In the book of Daniel, and when you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Now, in the Old Testament, there was only one man. How many? One. There was only one man in the Old Testament that was called greatly beloved. Anybody know who he was called? Who was that that was called greatly beloved? Daniel. Daniel. Let's look at that. In the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9, beginning in verse 21. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Here, Daniel was praying. Gabriel, the highest angel in glory, came to see Daniel. That means that man must have been special. What do you say? But you know, Gabriel will come to see you if you listen. The Bible says, Daniel 9. It says in verse 21, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Verse 22 says, And he informed me and talked with me, saying, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee what? Skill and what else? 
So here it is that God sent the highest angel in glory, the covering cherub, and he came down and he said, I have come, Daniel, to make you understand. But let's see why. He gave him the prophecies. Look at the next verse. Daniel 9, look at it in your Bible. Please see in your Bible. Please look at it in your Bible. Look at your Bible. Daniel 9, look at what it says. Beginning in verse 23. Let's read it together. Verse 23. It says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art, let's say the next two words. What's the next two words? Amen. Greatly beloved. Let's say it together. Greatly what? Amen. Beloved. So the Bible says, in other words, God loves you greatly. Now, because of this love, what did God do for him? What did the love do? What did it say? Thou art greatly beloved, therefore, what? Because God loves you, understand the matter and consider the what? So the Bible says it was because of the love of God that he gave him the prophecies of Daniel to consider, to understand the vision and the prophecies. How in the world could the devil make us think that we can study, uh, that, 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 that if we want to see the love of God, that we would not study the prophecies? It was because of love that God gave the prophecies. In fact, the next, very next verse says 70 weeks have been determined that the prophecies of the 70 week came because God loves us. Question. In the New Testament, who is the apostle of Jesus that is known as the apostle of love? John. John. What do they call him? John the Beloved. Let's go to John. Let's turn there. John 20. That was the Old Testament. Let's go to the New Testament. The greatest prophecy of the Old Testament was given to the prophet because God loved him. Now in John chapter 20 in the New Testament, the greatest prophetic book of the New Testament is the book of Revelation. And in Revelation, John 20 tells us who the disciple was that wrote this book. He was called not only John the Revelator, he was called John the Beloved. Notice what it says, John 20, John 20, beginning in verse 2. John 20, beginning in verse 2. Let's read that together, verse 2. What does it say? The Bible says, Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom, what's the next word? Jesus loved and saith unto them, they have taken the, away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. So here, John the Beloved, when God wanted to find the prophet, the apostle, to give the greatest prophetic truth in the Bible to a prophet, he took the man that God says was beloved. And so in the Old Testament, the one whom God loved was received the prophecy. In the New Testament, the one whom God loved received the prophecy. Who in the Old Testament was called the friend of God? Talk to me. Abraham. Abraham. You remember Abraham? God came to Abraham. His wife couldn't have a child. God came to Abraham and said, you're getting ready to have a child. Three men visited him. And all, they didn't come to, to do something else. They came to tell him he was going to have a promised child. Am I right or wrong? But do you remember, this is just before the men left. Do you remember what happened? The two men went towards Sodom and Gomorrah. You can find the story in Genesis 18. They went towards Sodom and Gomorrah and Jesus stayed back. And Jesus said to Abraham, can I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Do you know that it's because of the love of God that he showed him that the destruction was coming upon the world? Do you know if you love somebody, if you really love somebody, are you going to hide from them the crisis and the need to get ready? What if a, a car was coming down this road and a young boy is in the street and you have a mother that loves her child and she sees the car coming and she's just going to watch the child while he gets run over? Look what the prophet says. Are we to what? Wait until the fulfillment of the prophecies of the end before we say what? Anything concerning them. Of what value will our words be then? What good would it be for me to tell you that Jamaica is getting ready to have a crisis after the crisis hits? What value would our words be then? If it ever is going to take place, you must tell it before it comes to pass so that when it comes to pass, you might believe. Is that what the Bible says? Now, my brothers and sisters, Jesus said, everything that I do, I make known unto my friends. John 15, 14. Now, my brothers and sisters, do you know that if a man loves his wife, you know, sometimes you can be trying to keep a secret from your wife. And if you really love your wife, it's hard to keep a secret. All of a sudden, you come over and you say, no, I wasn't supposed to tell you, but honey, this is the gift I have for you. You can't keep a secret if you love somebody. And God says, surely he will do nothing but reveal his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Now, what is the book in the New Testament that's known as the chapter of love? Anybody know what it's called? The greatest love chapter in the Bible? First Corinthians 13. Let's turn there. First Corinthians 13. Let's go there. 
1 Corinthians 13, notice what the Bible says. We are showing you, brothers and sisters, that love and prophecy cannot be separated. They go together. In the book of 1 Corinthians 13, notice what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13. This is called the love chapter. In fact, the Bible says that, 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 that tongues would fail. They would cease. Prophecies would fail. They would cease. In fact, the Bible says that love is the greatest thing in this universe. What do you believe? I believe too, don't you? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 13, the last verse of the chapter, it says, And now abide of what? Faith, hope, charity. What's charity? That's another word for what? Love. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity or love. The Bible says, though you give your body to be burned and have not charity, it profits you what? You can give all your goods to feed the poor, and if you don't have love, it profits of what? Nothing. So after talking about all this love, someone says, there it is, see? Focus on love and not prophecy. Then the very next chapter, chapter 14. Now remember, the apostle Paul didn't separate the chapters. That came hundreds of years later. The Masorites came later, history. Charity, this is one letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. And in this next chapter, same letter, notice the very next verse, chapter 14, verse 1. The Bible says, follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may what? Prophecy. Everywhere you turn, love and prophecy cannot be separated. And I say, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. Amen. They have been married by God. My brothers and sisters, it's a trick. It's a trick of the devil. He's tricky. He'll make a man think that what he needs in the summertime is a heater and what he needs in the wintertime is an air conditioner. What do I mean? What if a man came to you and told you, don't talk about the cross. Talk to me about the love of Jesus. You say that man was a fool. That man's a fool. Why? Because the cross is a revelation of the love of God. And so a man should be equally a fool if he says, don't talk to me about the prophecies. Talk to me about the love of Jesus. Why? Because prophecy is a manifestation of the love of Jesus. Amen. My brothers and sisters, this is why the devil hates prophecy. It says, shall we wait until God's judgments fall upon the transgressor before we tell him how to avoid them? Where is our faith? And I say love in the word of God. Must we see what? Things foretold come to pass before we will believe what he has said in clear, distinct rays. What has come to us? Light has come to us. And my question is, do you have the light? It says, light has come to us, showing us that the great day of the Lord is what? Near at hand, even at the doors. Let us read. And what else? Before it is too late. Let me tell you, it's almost too late right now. Do you know right now, just because you read the Bible doesn't mean you understand? Jesus said, whoso readeth, let him understand. I'm going to ask you, and my, our brothers in the back, we, we, we're talking now. Under this tent, we want to listen to the word of God. Amen? Amen? I believe that when God opens up the Bible, God's presence is in this building. Amen. God's presence in the tent. We shouldn't give to the judge more respect than we give to God. Amen? Amen. You see, Jesus is getting ready to come. Yeah. And God needs men that are going to get ready. You see, listen, if we're lost... Somebody's going to say, well, I didn't know Jesus was coming. I didn't know Sunday law was coming. Probation was closing. And God's going to say, you were at the tent. You had a whole week. But you were too busy. God is trying to save each and every one of us. I'll never forget, we were in the States one place. And in the States, we were doing a meeting. And in the back, there was a young man that was talking. Young man just talking. I'm the first night of the meeting during the week of prayer. First night of the meeting. And I'm looking at him. I said, Lord, I don't want to have to embarrass that young man. So I ignored him for a moment. Then I kept going, and all of a sudden, the young man kept talking, joking, laughing. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said to me, tell that young man to be quiet. I said, Lord, I don't want to embarrass him. The Holy Spirit said, are you my minister? I said, yes, Lord. He said, do what I said. I said, young man in the back, I don't want to embarrass you. Please be quiet. Young man, look up, boom. Pick up his Bible. Start listening. You see, the devil only attacks those whom God can use the most. God doesn't, the devil doesn't try worthless material. He tries to trap those whom God can use the most. You asked Saul before he became Paul. You asked the men of God. That young man woke up. I wish when I was a young man, I used to have my hair braided back, pants hanging down, running the streets, looking like a fool thinking I was cool. I wish that someone would have shown me the authority of the word of God and that God loved me and wanted me to stand for him in this last days. That young man, I forgot all about him. 
About uh, several months later, I came back to the same state during another week of prayer at another church. A young man came to me at the end and said to me, he said, do you remember who I am? I said, no. He said, well, I was a young man talking at such and such church. I said, well, now I remember you. <laughs> he said, well, when you told me to be quiet, I took it serious. He said, I looked up. No one ever told me that. I didn't know it was so serious. He said, I stopped jumping. He said, you know, the rest of the week I came every night with my Bible. He said, you know, after you left, I gave my heart to Jesus. That young man is a missionary today. Amen. God is trying to prepare us for the coming of the Lord. My brothers and sisters, you must understand that the Bible is clear in the book of Mark. What book did I say? Mark chapter 1. The Bible tells us that this is the ministry of Jesus. When you study the life and ministry of Jesus, you will find that Jesus used the prophecies as the foundation of his ministry. And I think that we need to become more like Jesus. What do you say? Can you improve upon the ministry of Jesus? Can you preach better than Jesus preached? The best thing we can do is imitate the life of Christ. Does that make sense? Notice what it says. This is the burden of Christ's preaching. Well, stay with us, brothers. Stay with us, brothers. Come on, brothers. Stay with us. Heavenly Father, I plead that you will rebuke the spirit of the devil. I plead that you will humble us, Lord, to understand that we are in a serious time. That probation is about to close. That God would show us that you want to use us. Lord, this is no laughing matter. Show us, Lord, that a crisis is here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me tell you something. When Noah preached, there were people that were laughing and joking and ridiculing, but not when the storm broke. Said so that thunder came right on time. Why, when Noah preached and the thunder peeled from the sky. When the thunder started rolling and the lightning started flashing, then all those that thought that Noah's message was a crazy, fanatical excitement, they wished that they had got on board. They wished that they took it serious. They wished that they had listened, and then the waters of the flood deluged them, and we're told the same thing is getting ready to happen again. My friends, notice the preaching of Jesus. Desire of Ages, page 233. Notice what the prophet said. Let's read it together. The prophet says, The burden... Question, what does burden mean? What does burden mean? That's the weight. This is the heaviest preaching, of the, the heaviest part of Christ's preaching. The burden of Christ's preaching was what? The time is... So Jesus was talking about the prophecies? Question, is that in the Bible? So everything the prophet says, the Bible says. Everything the Bible says, the prophet says. You believe that? Well, then you're almost a seven day Adventist. Now listen. In Mark chapter 1, it tells us this. Let's look at that. Mark 1. We'll come back to the screen. Mark 1. Mark 1, beginning in verse 14. Look at this. Mark 1, beginning in verse 14. Let's read that together. The Bible says, Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the what? Gospel of the kingdom of God. Here's Jesus. You can't improve upon him. I want to be just like Jesus. How about you? No other man under heaven whereby we might have salvation. Let's notice the preaching of Jesus. The Bible says he was preaching. Verse 15 says, And saying what? The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and do what? Amen. Now watch now. So the Bible says it. This is how Jesus preached. That means that Christians should be just like Jesus. It says, the burden of Christ's preaching was, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Thus, the gospel message, as given by the what? Savior himself was based where? Not on emotionalism. Not on the music. It was based on the what? Prophecies. The prophecy, the time which he declared to be fulfilled was the period made known by the angel Gabriel to Daniel because he was greatly beloved. Same prophecies. Love and prophecy cannot be united. How can someone say that they're studying about the love of God? How can someone say that they're studying about Jesus and then say in the same breath, don't study the prophecies? Jesus led us back to the prophecies. My brother and sister, if we're going to be just like Jesus, we must do what he did. In fact, the prophet says in the book called Evangelism, page 196, let's read it. It says, ministers should present the what? Sure word of prophecy as the foundation of the faith of what? Seven-day Adventist. Are you a seven-day Adventist? Yes. Then if you are a seven-day Adventist, what should be the basis of your presentation? Ministers should present the prophecy as the foundation of the faith of seven Adventists. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation should be carefully studied. And in connection with them, the words, Behold, the Lamb of God will take away the sin of the world. Who is the Lamb of God? Jesus. There is no other name like Jesus. Sweetest name I know. 
This is the name of Jesus. And prophecy and Jesus cannot be separated. What God have joined together, let not man put asunder. Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Where until you do well that you take heed. As a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star. Who is the day star? Jesus. Prophecy and Jesus cannot be separated. Amen. Why the devil is tricky to make you think you can follow Jesus and give away rid of the prophecies. Why it's not called the revelation of John. It's called the revelation of Jesus Christ. The devil will be glad for us to use not to make the revelation our study. And this is why we've got to get back to the prophecies. You see, when we understand the time, the devil knows that we're going to wake up. In fact, you know, the Bible says, and that, not guessing the time, the Bible says, and that what? Knowing, Knowing the time, time, that now it is high time to do what? Do you know that when we understand the time, we begin to start waking up? Amen. Brothers and sisters, this is the science behind revival and reformation. Let's read this together. The prophet says in a book called Testimonies to Minister, every minister was supposed to read this book. Look what it says. Page 118. Let's read it together. It says, the perils of the what? Last days are upon. Now, I know you're ready to go home, so I'm getting ready to let you go. But I want you to understand something. Please, please. I know you're ready to go, but, but, but I want you to see something. It says, the perils of the last days are upon what? Us. And in our work, we are to warn, don't entertain the people. Amen. Don't bring some band and some uh, drums and some guitars and all the rest and just sing songs. Don't do that. They can do that at the club somewhere. Amen. It says, warn the people of the danger, not that is coming, but of the danger that they are in. Listen, in Jamaica, you are in danger. In Mandeville, you are in danger. We're going to show you this week that a crisis is getting ready to start in America. It's going to become worldwide. And Jamaica is going to be one of the first islands that bows under the submission of the Pope of Rome. We're going to show you that the man of sin is going to claim Jamaica as his own. And Jamaicans, many of them, are going to bow in submission because they have never been warned of the third angel's message. Where's the seven Adventists that's going to stand up? It says, warn the people of the danger this end. This is why we're here in Mandeville. We came here. Yes, I love mango, but that's not why I'm here. Yes, I love pineapple, but that's not why I'm here. Yes, I love pear, but that is not why I'm here. I'm here because a storm is coming. Amen. We're not hearing this from the press. We're not hearing this from the pulpit. It says, let not the solemn saints, which prophecy has revealed, be left untouched. If our people were what? That means that we're not even half awake. We're sleeping, lying down, loving the slumber. It's like we're turned to the left. You know when a man turns to the left, you know he's knocked out. That man's knocked out. I remember we was in the airport one place. And I was telling my wife, every time a man turns to the left like this, he's gone. Now when he turns to the right, he's still a little foggy. When he turns to the left, it's over. We was walking down. This, this literally happened. We were walking to the airport. All of a sudden, the man was sleeping. He, he bobbed to the right. My wife looked at him and said, he's sleeping. I said, no, he's not asleep yet. He's just a little dazed. All of a sudden, a man turned to the right, and then boom, he went to the left. Boom. I said, now he's asleep. Praise God. See, this says, if they were half awake, if they, what's the next word? Realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation. A reformation would be wrought where? In our churches. This is not a message to bring us out of the churches. This is a message that's going to bring us into the churches. This is a message to bring revival and reformation in and apostasy must go out. Yeah. God is going to have a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. It's going to be blameless and holy without spot or wrinkle because it's been bathed in the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Now, this says, and many more would do what? Listen, I have seen atheists become Adventists. I have seen people who have been gun slingers, gun total gangsters, put it down and pick up a Bible. I have seen those that have been selling nothing but weed and gunja turn to the spirit of God. I have seen this power go into the church and into the world. And it's amazing that while God can change the world, that mostly seven day Adventists are too, 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 too careless to wake up. My brothers and sisters, this says we have no time to lose. Let Daniel speak. But back up. It says, advanced new principles, crowd in the what? I'm trying to give you as much as we can. We're getting ready to close, but I'm trying to give you as much as we can. Amen? Amen. Do you want some more? Yes. Praise God. 
It says, let Daniel speak. Let the revelation speak and tell what is true. Let Daniel talk to us. Let revelation talk to us. Tell what is true. But, but what? Whatever phase of the subject is presented, uplift. What's that name? There is no other name like Jesus. Uplift Jesus. Let me tell you something. When you see our trouble, how much of a crisis we're in, let me tell you something. Listen, this week we're going to show you we have a few short months left and we're sleeping. We're more interested in our jobs. And this week we're going to show whether we really believe in our jobs more than Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you put your job above Jesus, you will receive the mark of the beast. I'm telling you what I know. Now, my brothers and sisters, uplift who? Jesus. Not yet, not yet, not yet. So shortly, shortly. Uplift what? Jesus as the what? Center of all hope. The root and offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Do you know that our only hope is in Jesus Christ? And Jesus is not in the outer court. Jesus is not in the holy place. You know where Jesus is? He is in the what? I want to go where Jesus is. What do you say? Now, my brothers and sisters, if we're going to wake up, we've got to understand the prophecies. Now, what is going to bring revival and reformation? What does it say here? If they what? Now, can something be near you and you not realize it? Can a car get ready to crash into you, beside you, in your blind spot, and you don't realize it? Is it possible to be at the end of the world and not realize it? It says that if they realize the nearness of the events portrayed in the revelation, a reformation would be wrought where? And many more will believe the message. My brothers and sisters, do you know that there are people that call us from China? There are people that email us from India, from Africa, from the islands of the sea, and from Fiji, all around this world. And do you know that they are watching these DVDs in places where there's no such thing as electricity? They're going up in the mountains. They're studying these DVDs. They're studying what we're talking about. And they're saying to get ready. And it's amazing that you and I, who have power and money and ability, that we are too confused and we're too caught up to pay the prophecies any attention. But what shall the prophet of man to gain the whole world? And to lose his soul. Now, if we're going to understand, that means that we must know the time if God is going to wake us up. Now, if we're going to know the time, Jesus is telling us that if we're going to know the time and understand the time, that one of the first things that we must recognize is the nature of why. Now, why the nature of sin? Go in your Bible to James. Go, go to James. Go to James. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring out some of these final points, please, Lord, help us to understand before it is too late. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I can see we're just at the surface of the message, but I'm not going to try to finish. I can't finish, but I want to give you enough today before we close. James chapter 1, notice the nature of sin. James chapter 1, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. James chapter 1, we must understand, think about the nature of sin, and that nature of sin tells us that there is a what? Now, we're going to show you that in just a moment in James chapter 1. Now, if a physician, you came to the physician, and the physician told you, uh, as you got inspected, you took your uh, diagnosis, and the physician says, you have a terminal cancer. You have a what? What is a terminal cancer? You know what that is? That's the type of cancer that's going to kill you. He said, you have the terminal cancer. It's metastasized. Going throughout your bloodstream, all throughout your body. He says, you have three weeks to live. What do you say to him? Do you say he's a time setter? Do you say that? I've never heard a man say he's a time setter. You know what I heard a man say? I've heard a man say he must know something about the nature of the disease. So when a man understands the nature of something, they know how long it takes for that cancer cell to metastasize until it gets into the body, until it gets to the brain and heart and stops its function. And when you understand something of the nature of sin, you don't wonder, you know that we're living in the final generation. Notice what the Bible says in James chapter 1, there's a nature of sin. In James chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. James 1, beginning verse 14, let's read that together. The Bible says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Own lust and enticed. Verse 15, the Bible says, then when lust have conceived, it bring forth what? Sin. Now notice the nature of sin. And sin, when it is what? Question, does sin have an end? Yes or no? The Bible says when sin is what? Finished. When sin is finished, what does it do? It brings forth death. So the very nature of sin, you know that brother? The very nature of sin suggests that there is an end. Isn't that right? Let me think of that. There's an end. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Question. Is the death of the man the beginning of his life or the end of his life? 
is the death of the man the beginning of his life or the limit of his life? So that tells us then that when sin entered the world, that a limit was set on how long the world could exist. Do you know that before sin entered the world, the world could have existed forever. God made man with something called conditional immortality. That if man had remained obedient, man could have lived forever from Jesus in the tree of life. But when sin entered the world, a limit was set. A lame lamb was slain from the foundation of the what? World. Now watch this now. This is because of the nature of sin. Watch. Notice what the prophet says. The same thing the Bible says. Christian service 44. Let's read it together. It says a what? Now remember the nature of sin. This is what makes the limit. A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from how much? All iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring us serious consequences upon God's people when? Today, as did the same what? Sin upon ancient Israel. Notice what sin does. Let's read together. There is a what? Limit. There's a limit beyond which he will no longer delay his judgments. Will God wait forever? No. There is a limit. In fact, if you study this phrase throughout the spirit of prophecy, there is a limit. You will find again and again throughout the writings, the prophets say, there is a limit, there is a limit, there is a limit. Look at a few. Christian courage in conflict 53. The flames that consume the cities of the plain. What city is he talking about? Sodom and Gomorrah. Why did Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed? Homosexuality. Do we see that today? Do you know that the limit is not reached in America and Jamaica? Very soon in this generation, Jesus would have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah says that the cities of the plain shed their warning light down even to our time. We are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears what? Is God long-suffering? Is he loving? Is he kind? But there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. It says there is a limit beyond which men may not go on in what? Sin. There's a nature of sin. There's a limit. When that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy are withdrawn and the ministration of judgment begins. All throughout the prophet, the writings tell us God is merciful. He's long-suffering. But there is a limit. And the question this morning is, is that limit almost reached in 2014? And if it is, we need to know it from the Bible. Amen? Amen. The book of Acts. What book did I say? Let's go to Acts 17. Acts 17 tells us this. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says, in the book of Acts 17. Acts 17. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Acts 17. Notice what the Bible says in Acts 17. The same thing that the prophet says. There is a limit. There is a limit. Acts 17. When you're there, let me know by saying amen. amen. We're going to begin in verse 24. Here the apostle Paul's on Mars Hill, talking about the unknown God. In verse 24, the Bible says... God that made the what? Now notice the apostle is getting ready to tell us something about the world. About the what? About the world. Let's see what he says about the world. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, verse 26, and have made of how, how many blood? Have made of what? One blood. That's right. How many nations? Does that include Jamaica? Does it include America? He has made all nations of men for to dwell on how much of the earth? Now, if you deal with all the face of the earth, are you dealing with one nation or the whole world? So the apostle never changed his subject. He's talking about the world. He said that all nations on the world. Now, notice what he says about the world. He's going to tell us something about the world. Verse 26 says, and have, what's the next word? Question. What does it mean to determine? Anybody know what it means to determine? Determine means to make a decision. Is that right? So God determined something about the what? About the world. That's what the text says. He made the world. Something is determined about the world. Something God decided about the world long before the world was ever brought into existence. You're going to find out that God determined two things. How many things? Two things about the world in this text. How many things? Two. Now what is the first thing based on the text? What is the first thing that God determined about the world based on the text? It says, and have determined the, what's the next word? What's the first word? The what? So God has determined the what? So number one, God has determined the time before what? Appointed. So you mean to tell me that God had already made a decision about the time that the world would be in existence? Yes or no? Or did it surprise him how long the world was going to be in existence? So it says God determined the time 
before appointed of how long the world was going to be in existence once sin was introduced. Now, that's one thing. Now, did I make that up? Is that what the Bible says? Is that what the Bible says? Yes or no? Yes. What's the second thing? It has determined the time before appointed and the, what's the next word? Bounds, Bounds of the habitation. So number one, he's determined the time for the world. Is that what the text says? Yes. Did I put that in the text? No. Is that in your Bible? Yes. What's number two? Bounds. The bounds. So number two, he's determined the what? Bounds. Now, what is a bound? Is where we get our word boundary. Is that right? Now, I know sometimes in America they don't understand. And I know this just the same in Jamaica. They used to say that the line said that you say this far, no further. But in Jamaica, they don't respect the line. Is that right? In America, they don't respect them either. But those lines are to symbolize a bound or a boundary or another word that means what? Limit. So now, God has determined about the world a time. God has determined about the world its bound. Now, if you put that together, tell me what you get. There is a what? Now, did I say that or did the Bible say that? The Bible says there is a limit. Everything the prophet says, the Bible says, I want to show you, this is the exact words. And my brother and sister, you've got to find out something. That there is a number that is always associated with the limit in the Bible. What limit, what number of the Bible is associated with the limit? Seven. That always takes us to the end, seven. Seven, seven, seven. That always reaches us to the limits. That always takes us down. Now, you need to write down in your notes that something happened in 2008. 2000 and what? 2008. Write that down. We can't talk about today. This week, we're going to study. From the Bible, something happened. Go to Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew. Go to Matthew 24. Something happened, we're going to study from the Bible. Inspiration tells us. Something happened in 2008 that let us know that our generation did something very prophetic. Very prophetic. Not based on the date, but based on the event. Something happened in 2008. We can't talk about it this morning. We'll talk about it this week. But after this, something happened in 2008 to let us know that our generation is getting ready to reach the what? The limit. We're going to prove this. We're going to prove this. Inspiration tells us there's a limit. Christ Object Lessons 177. Tell me if you heard this in the Bible. Let's read it together. It says, the what? Has become bold in transgression of God's law. Any time that a man can come up and say that, that, that the two men can marry each other despite what God said, that's bold transgression. Any time when a man can claim to be a minister and he commits adultery and fornication, that's bold transgression. It says, man has become bold in transgression of God's law because of his what? Because God has been so merciful to us. Man is thinking that God is not going to set a limit. It says, men have trampled upon the, his authority. They have strengthened oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, how doth God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? Psalm 73, 11. Let's read this together. But there is a what? A line beyond which they cannot pass. Do you know there is an invisible line that's placed in the sand of time? God's saying the nations can come this far, but no further. Many, many tickle your farce. It says, the time is near when they will have reached the what? Prescribed limit. What does prescribe mean? Pre means before. Scribe means to write it down as a scribe. So to write before the limit is what we read in the Bible. Did the Bible say that? It says that the time is near when they will have reached the prescribed limit. Even now they have almost exceeded the what? Did we see that in the Bible? Saying the same thing. Of the long suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his what? Now, God is not an indulgent parent. You know, a parent will say, if you don't see, you're going to what? Fear. Fear. Well, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and you won't feel it in just a little while. It says that when you don't, my brothers and sisters, it says the limits of his grace, the limits of his mercy, the Lord will do what? God's not going to sit back. When we reach the limit, God's not going to just continue to let the world go on. God is going to stand up and oppose. He is not an indulgent parent. We say to our children, get ready. You got to be ready this time. And then they're not. We stay back and wait. God says, no. He's long-suffering. He's loving. But there is a limit to the forbearance of Jehovah. It says, the Lord will oppose to vindicate his own honor to deliver his people and to repress the swellings of unrighteousness. And the question is, in 2014, have we neared that limit right now? Can we know? Go on your Bibles to Matthew 24. The prophet tells us that there's a limit. Amos 3, 7, you know what it says. What does Amos 3, 7 say? Amos 3, 7 says, surely the Lord God will do how much? Nothing. nothing. How many things is nothing? 
The Lord will do nothing but reveal his secret unto his servants, the what? Prophets. What is the number that is associated with the limit? Seven. The whole Bible was built on number seven. Am I right or wrong? In the book of Genesis, it opened up the very first day in Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Then it said, in the evening of the earth, even the morning with the first day, with the first day, and goes day one, day three, all the way to day six, and then Genesis 2, day seven. The Bible opens up with a seven-day period. You go to the, all throughout the Bible, you see this. In the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation is built on the number what? Seven. How many candlesticks? How many churches? How many seals? How many trumpets? How many plagues? The beast has how many heads? Seven, 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 and in each case, the seventh is not the first but the last. It's not the beginning but the limit. Seven always reaches the limit. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is built on this. Now, my brothers and sisters, everywhere you turn, the handwriting is on the wall. This is CBS News. Do you know about CBS in Jamaica? Yes or no? It's world news. Look what it says. It says, 2011, world population will reach what? How many billion? Do you think it's accidental the world's getting ready to reach 7 billion people? Do you think it's accidental? Does God play dice with the universe or does God finish everything in seven? Now, my brothers and sisters, it says world population in 2011. What's that word? That means that in 2011, it wasn't there yet. Is that right? Did we reach 7 billion in 2014? Are we here? Yes. This says a child is born and world population hits what? 7 billion. We're in 7 billion plus right now. They said... Will there be enough food? You know, the scientists have said that 7 million people on the planet, there's not enough water. There's not enough food. There's not enough land mass. Everything is showing the handwriting's on the wall. I don't care where you turn, whether prophetically, politically, economically, religiously, socially, everything says we are nearing the limit that this generation is getting ready to come to us in. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us that this world has reached 7 billion. Question, has there ever been a time in Earth's history where the world has had 7 billion people. Yes or no? Someone said no. There was only one time. Do you know that when Noah preached? Do you know that when Noah preached that there were 7 billion people on the planet? The days of Noah, 7 billion people. Where are we today? Watch. Now, there's a group of people called creation scientists. They're not seven Adventists. They're called creation scientists uh, known outside of the church. You know what they are? Mathematicians. Doctors, psychiatrists, men of so-called letters, they believe the Bible, they believe in creation, they've been studying the Word of God. Do you know they use the same type of mathematical precision in which we use to identify the population? They went back to the book of Genesis 5, they look at the age of man, they looked at how many babies were born, they use that same type of mathematical estimation, and notice what they found out. Look what this says. It says that, 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 that if you start the age of this and you calculate the population of the world just before the flood, it would be about what? Seven billion people. This is greater than the current world population. They wrote this a few years back. This is what the world knows. The world knows this. This is the Internet. Look what the Internet says. The Internet says how many people died in the flood of Noah's day. The figure arrived at would be around what? Do you know, brothers and sisters, do you know that for the first time that our generation after 2011 has come back to the exact same condition that we were before the flood? The last time we reached 7 billion people, the world reached its limit and it was destroyed by the flood. Someone says that was Noah's day. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Do you know, brothers and sisters, that your grandparents have never seen this? Somebody says, well, I used to believe like you when I was a great grandparent, but your great grandparent did not have 7 billion people. Never happened. Now, my brothers and sisters, you must understand, today we reach the first time. Now, this is a stat from the government, from the United Nations. And they tell us, let me blow it up so you can see it. World population reached 1 billion what year? Listen to me. Do you know that from the flood, which took place about 1,656 years after creation, that it took over 3,500 years from the flood, where they only had eight people, it took over 3,500 years, it took to get back to only one billion people. So you understand what I'm saying? Since the flood, that there's no, been no generation ever lived uh, uh, to get seven billion. The, the first time they got one billion was in one year. What year did they get second? Two billion people. What year did they get three billion? What year did they get four billion? 1974. What year did they get five billion? 1987. What year did the world get six billion? You know, in 1999, we we're getting ready to reach the limit. You remember Y2K? Everybody was afraid of this, and they jumped back and forth, but we didn't understand the prophecies as being fulfilled right now. 
Then in 2011, just before 2012, we reached 7 billion. This is not accidental, but my brothers and sisters, something else is getting ready to happen. You know what's getting ready to happen? One saying that the Savior must not be made to destroy another. No, no man know the day no hour is coming. We are instructed and required to know when it is what? Yeah. Question. We cannot know the day and hour of Christ's coming. But the Bible says we can know when it is what? Yeah. Does the Bible say that? Yeah. Where is that in the Bible? Matthew 24. Let's look at it. Heavenly Father, please, as we get ready to close right now, show us, Lord, that time is running out. And that whatever we do, we must do quickly. We need you, Jesus, like we've never needed you before. Our church needs you. We need you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Is this serious, brothers and sisters? This is serious. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3. Notice what the Bible says. Beginning in verse 3. Matthew 24, verse 3. The Bible says, And as they sat where? Upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And of the what? Give me another word for in that starts with the letter L. What should be the sign of thy coming and the limit of the world? And Jesus said, you can't know the limit. Go to sleep. Go home. That's not what he said. He gave us all of 24. They gave us the signs, all of 25. They gave us the experience. Jesus told us we can know. In fact, Jesus said, when, they shall see, when you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled. This is the beginning of sorrow. Nations shall rise against, kingdom against. There shall be famines and what else? Pestilence. But then Jesus said, very definitely, in verse 32, Matthew 24, 32. The Bible says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and you put it forth leaves, you don't guess. You know the time. You know that summer is what? Now, you may not know about that in Jamaica, but in some parts of the earth, when it gets cold, sometimes it snows. When they get snow on certain types of trees, what happens to the leaves? They fall off. Now, the spring of that year, when winter is past, and the spring of that year comes, what happens to those same leaves? Do you think in America, when they see this ever happen ever all the time? Do you think that when, when, when they see the leaves come back on the trees, you think they start running, knocking on the door? <laughs> door never? What does the leaves mean? You think, you think they do that? No, they know when they see the leaves, they know what time it is without a calendar, without a date. They know the time of night because of the signs. Jesus says, it's just like a fig tree. The Bible says that you know that summer is nigh. But then it goes on to say, verse 33, the great prince of teacher used this as an object lesson for the last days. And verse 33, it says, so likewise, when you shall not hide this, when you shall see all these things, know that it is what? Near. near. How near? Yes. Question. How near should we know the Christ is coming? Can we know the day and the hour before the close of probation? The prophet told us this in the Bible. Just a few verses later, it tells us that. You can't know the day and the hour before probation closes. Question. But how near can we know based on Jesus? Because he said we should know that it is near. How near can we know? The Bible says, even at the door, is it important that we know? Yes. Is it salvific that we know? Yes. How do we know? Look what it says. It says we are instructed and what's the next word? Required. If you go to college and you take an elective, that's the course you can decide. You don't have to graduate with that. But if it's a required course, is it essential? Yes. It says instructed and required to know when it is what? We are further taught that to disregard is warning and to refuse or neglect to know when its advent is near will be as what? Is that life and death? It will be as fatal for us as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah not to know when the flood was coming. Can you imagine? They die by water, wake up, be lost by fire. That's a terrible death. And the Bible says that it is required that we know when it is near. How near is near? Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us, you don't have to guess, in verse 34, The lights went on. But it didn't matter. God's word was still being heard. What do you say? Amen. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. This is unnatural. The devil's afraid of this. Yes. Heavenly Father, be with us as we look at this last part. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So you should understand this is a battle. But this is not flesh and blood. Nobody at the conference did that. That was the devil. Yes. We're not fighting man. We're fighting the devil. Amen. We better understand something. Listen. 
The Bible says that we could know it's coming as near how near? Even at the what? Doors. Even at the door. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us how near that is. Let's see. Next verse. In verse 34. Over here with the screen. The screen. Verse 34. What does it say? In verse 34 it says, Verily. What's the first word of verse 34? What's it called? Verily. verily. Question. Does verily. What does it mean? It means what? Surely. Does it change the subject? No. No, verily does. Well, it's okay. It's all right. We, 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 it's all right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Verily does not change the subject. Question. Verily does not change the subject. You remember, you remember Nicodemus. You remember that? You remember Nicodemus? This was Nick at night. He came to see Jesus. He came to see Jesus. And when he came to see Jesus, he tried to flatter Jesus because Jesus was a straight preacher. Jesus, or Jesus had not gotten the training that Nicodemus had. Nicodemus was called a master of the law. Nicodemus had his PhD. He said, teach Jesus. We know that thou art a teacher sent from God. Jesus was not flattered. Jesus said, you must be born again. Nicodemus did just like you and I. You know, sometimes somebody says something else. We're we upset. Man, uh, how are you going to talk to me? I'm a master. You're just a, you're just a carpenter. How can you talk to me? He was upset. But he knew that Jesus was filled with love. So he stopped by and he said, can I go back up to my mother's womb? And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. Did Jesus change his subject? So verily does not change the subject. Verily means of a certainty, of a surety. It's the truth. In other words, if you don't understand, let me make it plain. And so Jesus said, you should know when you see this, that it's coming as near. How near? Even at the door. How near is that? I don't understand. Jesus said, verily. In other words, if you don't understand what it means to be at the door, let me make it plain to you. What does the text say? This generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Question, is that the first generation or the last generation? Is that the limit generation? Is that the beginning generation or the final generation? And I'm telling you today that we're in that final generation. I was going to show you on the screen. It went out. The devil is just upset about that, but I'll tell you and we're close. Listen, the Bible tells us that there's one great event that's going to let us know without a shadow of a doubt what that is. When that line is drawn, we're told that it is the mark of the beast. You know what that is, don't you? It is the enforcement of Sunday worship. We're told that America and the Pope are going to join forces. But that would never happen. The Pope and the President of America would never visit each other. Yes or no? We're going to show you on this screen that this Pope that's in there, Pope Francis, is no ordinary Pope. We're going to show you from this screen that something is happening, that, that the ISIS group, do you know that there's something right now going on in prophecy? We're going to show you tonight and this week that we're in a crisis, brothers and sisters, and the only thing that is not ready is us. The world is ready. The Catholic Church is ready. America is ready to put this in place. And the only ones that are not ready are seven-day Adventists. We're sleeping. There's a great work that must happen in a little time. And God is going to use this church. And feeble and effective as it may appear, it's not going to remain this way. It's going to be a shaking. And we're told that over 90% of the seven of church is going to be shaken out. Because they don't take it serious. They're too much significant with their jobs. They look too much with their cares of this life. With the pleasures of sin. This week, we're going to talk about how to get ready. We're going to talk about how to get that experience with Jesus. In the most holy place that this Seventh Adventist church will rise up. It will make its move, its mark in this world. It will prepare people to stand. And my question is, are you going to be a part of it? I want to be a part of it. What do you say? Let's pray.